Hi, and welcome to Newsmakers. I'm your host, Jerry Roberts. Tonight, a special edition presenting the four candidates in the June 5th special election for the District 3 City Council seat on Santa Barbara's west side. Joining us in alphabetical order and identified by their official ballot designation are educator, journalist, filmmaker, Oscar Gutierrez, student, Elizabeth Hunter, campus safety officer, Ken Rivas, and small business owner, Michael Vidal. Welcome and thank you all for coming. And let me say at the start, thank you all for running. It's, uh, it's not an easy job running, no. <laughs> being a candidate and putting yourself out there. And I think the community owes you a, a, a vote of thanks as well. So thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. All right. Um, Oscar, I, I'm going to ask everybody this question. I'm going to start with you. After a lot of debate in the 1980s, Santa Barbara voters decided that given the city's carrying capacity, our space, water, and infrastructure, our population should be capped at 85,000. As you know, our current population is 91,000, and with all having all of you having talked about the need for more housing, workforce, affordable, low-cost housing, all of it will increase population. Give me a number. Considering what you've said about housing, how much population can Santa Barbara handle? I, I believe that we're pretty much getting close to a limit without actually developing on undeveloped land already, which I wouldn't suggest because uh, we have to be able to protect the environment, the little environment that we have left in the, in the area. It's just important to the overall you know, sustainability of the um, ecosystem and the aquifer as well. So, I mean, I, I don't want to start speculating on how much population the city, the city should have because, uh, you know, we start uh, sounding like certain very conservative groups out there that are trying to control the population of our city. But it is, states. but it is a real figure. I, I mean, it is a serious issue. Oh, absolutely, I agree. Uh, Ken or Elizabeth, you're next. Um, alphabetical order. I'll remember. Uh, what do you think the population ought to be given the carrying capacity of the city? Well, given the current carrying capacity, we can definitely say that the infrastructure and what we have right now is being being stretched thin. But when it comes to carrying capacity, especially with new technologies and new new discoveries that we're making, we can expand our carrying capacity. So I think that there is room for us to expand our population. How high? 100,000? Less than 100,000? It's hard to give an exact figure, but I feel that we could go over 100,000 slightly, but probably no more than that. Because right. it is area-wise, we are still a small town. But I feel that we can improve upon our caring capacity. Ken, you've talked a lot about the need for more housing. How, how high do you think we right. should go? Well, I like, well, okay, um, I'll answer that first. And uh, then I'll delve into the other part of that. Um, so, again, we are getting to a point where um, we're starting to see the impacts of that. And, um, again, some of it has to do with parking and uh so there's some impacts that come with more housing, um, but however, I think that the city has come up with an idea about the, uh, the accessory dwelling units, you know, um, putting some more, um, not necessarily adding more parking, um, or looking at how many parkings per household uh, we want to have. But I think I like that idea about, you know, letting the uh, homeowners um, Build making those uh, they call them granny yeah. units. Yeah, we'll get to and, that. And uh, making you know uh, allowing more space, more li livable space, uh, additional housing rentals, so we can you know uh, get more workforce in here. Um, again, uh, we are getting to limits, um, and I want to put a limit on it. Um, but you know, I think again, you know, you're saying we're at 91. Yeah, um, Elizabeth says a little bit over 100. You believe, you agree 100. with that? A little bit over 100. I, I tend to I tend to side with her on that. How sure. about you? What, what do you think the number ought to be? What's the magic number? So I think that we need to look at signs from the state. So for example, ADU, we knew when I was talking to Renee Brooks, the city planner, one of my questions I had for her was, did the ADU just come out of nowhere or did we see it coming down the pipeline? And she said that she saw it coming down the pipeline about six months before it got implemented. So I think we need to work with the state to figure out what their mandates or what their guidance is because with population growth and demography, all the cities are gonna get larger, that's the question. Now, the question is how, how much larger? So to put a number on your answer, 
10% seems safer, so that would put it close to 100,000. 20% starts to make me a little nervous because just I look at things in percentages, and when you start talking about 20% growth of anything, um, it's more substantial. 10%, 20%, last word. Sounds, <laughs> sounds about right. <laughs> All right. Um, every political campaign uh, is essentially a marketing campaign. You're out there marketing yourself. And, and there's, a, there's a principle in marketing called the criteria of choice. In other words, why is your product or your service or you different from your competitors? What differentiates you from all of the people that you're running against? Why should people choose you? What's the, what's the big factor? Me specifically? Well, yeah, you're, we're going alphabetical. We're, okay. Um, so me specifically, first of all, I am female, and that does separate me from a lot of, first of all, my other opponents, but also the only other females on city council right now are the mayor and Kirsten Sneddon. Also, I'm, as we all know, I am a lot younger than everybody. I am 22 years old. And that watch is- Watch it, watch <laughs> it. <laughs> um, and that, I think, <laughs> I think that definitely will give me a different perspective than maybe my other opponents might have. All right, Ken, what, what differentiates you? Well, what differentiates me is my work in the community itself. I've done uh, a lot of work with the uh, neighborhood residents um, and looking at their problems and working with the city council and uh, being a, not a, only an advocate for, uh, neighbor, for the neighborhoods, but also an advisor had the um, good fortune to uh, take on that position and work with city council, work with different mayors, you know, such as Marty Bloom, Halee Schneider, and now uh, Kathy Murillo. So um, I have uh, quite, quite a large, large many years of experience okay. in, in uh, working with the community and right. solving some, working out these problems and uh, addressing it to city council. Fair enough. Michael, what's the, what's the criteria of choice? I've had a lot of different perspectives in Santa Barbara. I've been an employee, I've been an employer, I've been a renter, I've been a homeowner. I've got a lot of experience creating budgets, managing budgets, making personnel decisions when it comes to a budget. I understand how difficult those decisions are. Um, I'm on a commission with the County of Santa Barbara, so I, with, so I have a, a good understanding, a grasp of, of pension management and with the Brown Act, which is unique. Um, I've had many years of experience being on a board, chairing boards. so. The interesting thing about this question is, is while we've been going through this process, I've been reminded many times, Michael, this isn't a job interview. Because if it was a job interview, they would look at your resume a lot more. But this is a job interview. This is a job interview that just doesn't last for one day. It lasts for dozens of days. And we're out there displaying our experiences and our skill sets. And the last thing I'll say is I think communication is important. I think words are powerful. I've been reading in the media that they, that they call me a, a slick talker or a smooth talker. No, I think that's him. That's so, <laughs> I've been hearing this a couple of times. And, and I just think communication is super important. Words are powerful. So right. to minimize that is an in, injustice. All right. Oscar, what differentiates <laughs> you that should make you the first choice in a group of four? Sure. You know, I, I was, I'm a first generation Mexican American, born and raised here. And uh, I've gone through the school system. You know, I, I, I know that specific district very well because I've been through a lot there, you know, going through natural disasters since, you know, the 80s to just a few months ago. And I know how resilient the community there is and I know how it's changed over the years. And my work with, you know, TV Santa Barbara and other nonprofits and the Red Cross have really get, got, gotten me a better understanding of everyone in the city you know, all the different organizations and institutions that I've had to cover and report on. And also my history with working for, for a city hall already for Carpinteria and covering hundreds of city hall meetings and broadcasting that information out to the people is, it's got me an understanding of how to collect information and give it to the, to the, to the masses so that they stay informed as to what's going on, not just in the local government, but in their city as well. Okay. And speaking of natural disasters, in the interest of full disclosure, we should say that Oscar is the 
a former uh, director of newsmakers, uh, speaking of natural disasters. Yeah, we noticed that the quality <laughs> dropped the last couple of weeks. What's going on there? <laughs> but we kicked him off uh, as soon as he decided he was going to. He was going to run for office. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, let me ask each of you an individual question. I, I, I just want to dig a little bit into some of the messages you've expressed in other forums. And Ken, it's your, your, you're up first this time. Uh, now, you've emphasized on the campaign trail and here tonight your many years of community service as an activist and an advocate, public servant. Given that you've been at this for de decades, why have you not won the endorsements of prominent political leaders of other city council of city council members or leading political organizations? Well that's a good question because um, I've worked on many of their campaigns. I've been I'm a lifelong Democrat. Uh, you know I'm gonna be 58 this year and I've been voting since 18 as Democrat um, on the Democratic ticket. Um, all for all those who have come and uh, been in um, assembly members, senators, uh, city council members, you name it. Uh, and uh, it's a little troubling. It's a good question because it's a little troubling that they wouldn't have reached out to me and, and talked to me about this. But, you know, it's, again, it was, I don't know, <coughs> it was, at first it was, you have to remember, first you, it was the DCC's choice, not the each. Democrat the, County Committee. Yeah, it wasn't their individual choice at first, but it was, it was the DCC's first choice. And so, um, over my, I mean, I was a political action coordinator for the California School Boys Association. Actually, I just regained that title recently because um, now I'm back with the school districts and with California School Employees Association. So I'll be doing some more political action with them. Um, but um, I, I can't uh, really pinpoint it. You know, there's more, there's more questions to be asked about why the endorsements didn't come. So. Okay, fair enough. Um, um, Michael. Uh, you've talked also about your experience in community service, which you said began after you left UCSB in the late 90s. But public records show that you've never voted in Santa Barbara. No voter history uh, found, uh, including in last year's mayor's race and the presidential race. How come? Why haven't you voted? So I didn't vote in the last mayor's election, you're correct. But I did vote when I was in Isla Vista. It's the first time I've ever registered, so I'm not sure why that is. I, I registered in Fresno um, because I was c traveling a lot. Yeah, you remember when that was? Um, I don't. And I think that there's been, there's been an opportunity with me being able to be more engaged in local voting. And I've admitted it. And I think that the things that I have done are even more important as far as, far as civic duties, as far as being involved in the community, as far as being involved in boards, as far as giving back from a mentorship standpoint. Good enough. Okay, fair enough. Um, Oscar, you're new to the business of running mm -hmm. for office. and. Some of your critics have charged that you'll be a puppet of Mayor Kathy Murillo, and they've used that word. Mm -hmm. uh, this campaign contribution statement, which came in after the deadline, shows that the mayor gave you $5,000. Mm -hmm. uh, her political ally, Greg Hart, gave you 2000 and a couple of other special interest union groups have given another couple of thousand. Given those large sums, which is about two-thirds of what you've raised, why should voters not believe that you'll just be carrying water for the mayor and for the Democratic Party? Because, you know, you can ask any of my former bosses or teachers if I've ever been a yes man. You know, these are people that were in charge of my grades and my checks, and just because they were in charge of that doesn't mean that I, I did everything they told me to, you know. <laughs> so, uh, Kathy is a supporter of mine, and, and I'm grateful for that, and, you know, she's somebody I looked up to and look up to now, and, you know, all I can say to her and to everybody is that my obligation and my loyalty is to the citizens of this city and what's best for them. All right. Uh, and Elizabeth, um, you've said that you'll bring fresh eyes, the youngest one in, in the race, to what you called the other night the antiquated systems at City Hall. But you acknowledge that that League of Women Voters uh, a forum that you've never attended a city council meeting. Uh, you're a full-time student at, at City College. Mm -hmm. Serving on the council is a big job, not just regular meetings, committees, handling constituent problems, attending events at night. How many hours a week do you figure you'll have to devote to constituents in City Hall business? How, how, many, how many hours are you able to commit? Well, if I balance it, I feel that it's pretty much almost a full-time full job, close to 35 to 40 hours a week. And you'll be able to do that with your full-time studies? Mm -hmm. 
And when will you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have much of a social life. <laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, Michael, you're up uh, first here, Benton, clean up or uh, lead off on this one. As you know, there's a big battle over immigration in California. And the governor and the legislature have passed a so-called sanctuary state law, which restricts uh, the amount of cooperation local law enforcement can have with federal immigration authorities. Now, President Trump has sued the state to try to toss this sanctuary state out, and a number of city councils in recent weeks in Southern California have joined the President, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, in opposing the state. A large number of immigrants who live in the 3rd District. Where should our city council be on this? Should we be a sanctuary city? Should we support or oppose a sanctuary state law? I would say yes. My only hesitation is because we of... We should support the law. We, no, we should support a sanctuary city. My, yeah. That's my knee-jerk reaction. But my hesitation is, is the funding that we would get from the state. We need to protect these, this population. One of the things that I've been talking about is we need to have more of like a buddy system with folks that don't have their documentation versus folks that do have their documentation to go to whenever they're have, having to go to appointments for immigration or anything so that we have a little bit more of a buddy system so that we can create a little bit more of camaraderie between those two populations. Um, that's a difficult conversation. If, if, if it wasn't for, and I don't know the details as far as money that we can get from the state, then I would say absolutely, let's make sure that we become a sanctuary city to, so we can protect this population. Um, but I don't, I don't know how to give more details besides that. Yeah, we're kind of whipsawed here because uh, the feds are threatening to take away federal funding mm -hmm. uh, if we're against sanctuary, if we're for sanctuary state, and the, and the state would take it away if we're not. So wh wh where do you think we ought to be, yay or nay on sanctuary state? I mean, we, these, these are people we're talking about, human beings, you know, and, and families and, you know, coming from a family who, uh, you know, my, my mother was deported when she had my, do my, uh, my oldest sister, and my older sister had to stay alone without my mom for two weeks while she was just three months old, you know, and, and that, that was just a horrible situation, and I, I don't want to see that happening here in Santa Barbara at this point in time in, in our history, you know, it's 2018. And it, these people are, are what kind of drive our economy to a certain point, because imagine if, if all the hotels and restaurants were raided, what's going to happen to our economy? Because that's, that's a big funder for our, our city. Or what happens if they if they raid the farms and the wineries, you know? So we should. We, we need to protect them. So absolutely, the, we do. Okay, so the and city also, police also, department should not be cool. No, absolutely, and also device. for the safety of the police officers as well. All right, Elizabeth, how where do you come down on sanctuary state? I definitely think that Santa Barbara should be a sanctuary city. I mean, growing up on the west side, I know the demographic there, and I know that these are the people that we need to protect, and that they need, you know, they need that protection, especially right now with with the presidency and Jeff Sessions and all that, we really need to protect them. Ken, do you think we should go the way of the uh, Orange County cities and, and oppose Sanctuary State, or should we support it? I think we should support Sanctuary State because um, we have to, we have to, uh, these are people and we have to deal with them in a humane way. And um, again, this, and we're not just talking about, when we're talking about immigrants, a lot of people uh, put the tag on that, you know, Mexican. Um, or Latino, and but we have immigrants from other countries. So the thing is, if this, I'm behind the state wanting to be a sanctuary state. However, I think they also, um, on the uh, as far as how are we going to go into this process with the funding, um, the state's going to have to come up with some ideas on how are we going to be able to carry this out if. Uh, Trump does what he's threatening to do. Right. Well, we got 26 lawsuits going against him so far. So <laughs> have a few more, I guess, won't hurt. Yeah. All right, Oscar, back to you. The city finance director recently reported that the city will pay nearly $25 million in pension costs in next year's budget. And that number is going to grow to $40 million over the next six or seven years. Put another way, as Josh Molina pointed out in his Newshawk piece, taxpayers now pay 52 cents for every dollar we pay in salary to a firefighter. Should the city be holding the line on salary and benefits for public employees to help address this problem? And if not, what do you propose to prevent pension costs from eating up the whole budget? Well, 
as it is, it's a two-tier system now since, what was it, 2015, 2013? 13. Yeah, and, you know, the employees are putting in more into their pensions now than they were in the past. And, I mean, how, how are you going to put a price tag on the people who are risking their lives to protect us, you know? Like, these people every day are putting their lives on the line, so obviously they should be protected once they retire. So it's kind of it's kind of hard, but you know we're, we're going to have to be careful on on when it comes to hiring in the future to make sure that you know we're not hiring too many people and making sure that we're being efficient with with the money we have to pay the people that we have now. Tough choices that the council's going to face. Oscar says, you know, we got to protect the, the, the public employees. Where do you where do you come down? I definitely agree. I mean, most of these, most of the pension is going towards firefighters and police, and we really need to support them, especially the firefighters in this county. We are a very fire-prone city, and we really rely on them a lot. And it will have to come down to city council being really creative and finding a way to make this work in the future. All right. Ken, any thoughts on how we can hold down pension costs more? Well, I'm the old guy here, and so <laughs> pensions is a, <laughs> pensions is very important to me. When we see pensions, I don't want anyone touching my pension. You're not the old you know? guy. Here. Yeah. Trust well, me. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't including you, but <laughs> but anyhow, we, we we do need to protect the employees' pensions. We 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 need to get uh, creative, and uh, again, uh, employees are paying more into it, so that it takes some of the burden off uh, the city. And so, um, but we have to we have to keep them intact. And again, I'm I'm for we have firefighters, um, and police, and we also have our service workers. The people that are out in the streets, and you may not consider them first responders, but they're out there doing a part. They they have a part to do in this whole uh, response. So um, again, um, I don't want to take anything away from the employees' pensions. You're on the county pension board, Michael, and and. Uh have dealt with this issue. I mean, isn't this something that's going to consume the, the whole budget? I mean, if you just kind of project it out? So the, and we'll just recap what a lot of people have said already. So PEPRA, which got passed in 2013, was basically the reduction of benefits and how they were talking about they're, they're going to be, um, employees are going to be contributing more. They also lowered the discount rate. They lowered it from 7.5, I believe, to 7%, but they phased it in until... And what does that mean? 2019, 2020. That's the expected return, basically. So when you lower the expected return, you basically can keep the health of the system going longer. Now, are those two adjustments alone going to um, close the gap of unfunded liability? No. We're at 60-something percent. The new normal, which I hate that word, is 80%. Um, um, the county is at 70-something percent. So there's, there's a big gap between where we need to be and where we are today. And to make it even more complex, when you look at uh, the baby boom population, I'm just easy, looking at you easy, because I'm just easy. looking at you because you told to look at you. But when you look at the baby boom population, it's the largest population except for the Gen Y population. So when you look at all those generations in between those two generations, and this happens with pensions, right? There's cycles. I noticed you didn't look at Elizabeth when you said Because you kept saying look at me. So, uh, so there's cycles. So even though it's a, we're in a very difficult place right now, it will level off a little bit, but there are going to be adjustments down the road. The question is what sort of adjustments. With that said, retirement is a very personal thing. It's very important. The one thing I've always said is when you look at the Social Security system, which is related to a pension system, kind of, sort of, um, when they change benefits, they give everybody about 30 to 40 years, right? As you know, Alan Greenspan, the mid-80s, decided to increase full retirement age. We still are not phased into full retirement age. The one thing that we need to do is be a little more realistic as far as the health of the system, and we need to figure out how we can make amendments or changes, but make them a little bit longer. So we're not making changes one year to the next or three years or less. All right. Um, Elizabeth, right? Yeah. So there's a debate over City Hall, Ken mentioned it earlier, about authorizing and building more granny units, so-called accessory dwelling units or ADUs. Mm -hmm. And whether homeowners who add such a unit should be required to live on the, in a dwelling on the property in perpetuity. Which side are you on on this issue? Perpetuity or not? I think, I think perpetuity because it would definitely prevent developers from just coming in and you know, buying up houses and kind of 
just taking over a neighborhood, whereas I really want this to focus on the people who are homeowners in the west side and throughout all of Santa Barbara to utilize their homes, and then also it helps to solve some of the housing issue and provide more housing. All right. Ken, forever? <laughs> <laughs> well, I am with uh, homeowners that live here, and because um, the thing is, is that you have to remember, sometimes, some homeowners will use it for rentable space, and that can be extra income for them when they're already on a fixed income. If you have homeowners on a fixed income, that dwelling, that rented dwelling space, you know, will help their income and also provide uh, additional rental for uh, someone that needs some housing. So you, you would vote for the yeah. perpetuity. Mm -hmm. How about you, Michael? You, you've talked about perpetuity is only slightly less than forever. What, a little bit more than forever. A it's a very than long than time. Um, I don't know, the, there's not many examples that are in perpetuity. Um, I met with um, someone from the county housing department and I didn't realize that inclusionary housing is only for like what, 40 years plus or minus. So even that alone is not in perpetuity. So I, I, I think that we need to have some sort of, you know, uh, some sort of timetable that's not just five years or 10 years. Um, 40 years seems like a very healthy timetable to be able to have some ordinance like this, even 30 years. Perpetuity <laughs> seems like a very long time. Should we sunset this or should it go on forever? It should go on forever. I agree with the majority of the council on their vote because uh, we need to be able to supply housing for the working class in this city to keep it going. And just to give it a sense of community, you know? Otherwise, you just have a transient community coming in and out and you lose the sense of what Santa Barbara is. All right. Um, Ken, now all of you have said uh, that District 3 has been neglected by City Hall, that mm -hmm. the West Side residents historically haven't gotten their share, fair share of public services and resources. Given that perspective, would you have a responsibility to put the special needs of the district first and the broader interests of the whole city second? How do you balance it? Well, you balance it, like I mentioned, in one of the forms is uh, public safety. If, if, if there's a need for public safety, then, you know, uh, putting up a light can, we, we do need it, but, you know, and things like that don't happen anyway. When we're talking about infrastructure and, and uh, you know, making, uh, fixing sidewalks and uh, making it more accessible for people when they're walking, um, it doesn't, it's not going to come in a day. It's not going to come in a month. But if, uh, you're, when you're looking at that, uh, what goes first? What are we going to focus on first? Again, it would have to be public safety. But at the same time, you can continue to put these uh, projects through, you know, and get bids on them. And um, those eventually, you know, come into completion. Um, so I would work, definitely work with the uh, Neighborhood Advisory Council because they have five sitting representatives on it now, currently. Five uh, from people from the west side, lower west side and uh, the west side. And I would, uh, would delve into that, work with that group, and um, you know, start making some, some movement on that. And I don't know why it hasn't happened yet, um, because that was my whole intent in merging the three uh, community groups together. Because there was a west, lower west side community group, west side community group, and the east side community group. And that was my whole intention in merging them together so they can work uh, collectively or collaboratively together and start uh, working with each other on all these projects. But it became really heavy-sided on the east side and uh, not so much on the west side. And now it's, it's the west side's turn. Uh, we got we to gotta help the west side and start making improvements there. So the question is, what's the higher priority, the <laughs> district or the city? <laughs> so how the city goes, the third district goes. And how the third district goes, the city goes. And I think it's important yeah. to say both of those. Um, I, I, it's hard for me to believe that we will have opportunities to actually favor the third district in a situation where we would neglect the city, as far as just votes that are gonna be coming down the pipeline. When we, walk, when, when we all walk around, and when you walked around, when you left two, two nights ago, I mean, how scary is it walking around and there's no lights? How scary it is. Well, I walked out with a mayor, so I wasn't too so, <laughs> But these kids are walking every day, twice to school and back to school. Not limited crosswalks, one cross mm -hmm. guard. It, it, we need, as a city and as a representative, to stand up for the third district, and we need to make sure that we deliver more resources to the third district. 
You're running as the West Side guy, mm -hmm. born, raised, educated. Learn to fight. I gotta ask you about yeah. that. One. <laughs> I, think, I think you refer to me as a homeboy. Is that right in your article? Something like that. Um, so I mean, are you going down to City Hall? You're going down to represent the West Side, right? Yeah. You're not. You're not. Well, the as thing interested is, in the in you know other districts. No, that's not correct. Of course I am, because this whole city raised me. You know, and but the thing is, is that we voted for district elections to get proper representation of the people that live in those districts and the needs of those districts as well. But yeah, we, ha we have to be balanced with the needs of the overall city, but also be able to shine a spotlight on specific spots that have been neglected historically, you know, and to try to alleviate that. All right. Elizabeth, third district or city, which comes first? I, I don't think that one comes over the other. Definitely District 3, it needs a lot more with, um, with safety, walking, and we need a lot more crosswalks, especially like walking around San Andreas. Like I live around there and sometimes I'll have to park my, my car like four blocks away at 10 p.m. at night and then I have to walk through that neighborhood. And we need a lot better lit streets and we need to be a lot more safe. And that being said, that will also better the whole community of Santa Barbara as well if one city becomes, or one part of the city becomes a lot more uplifted. And then there's also other issues that I think don't just concern the third district, but concern the whole city, like water conservation and making sure that new developments are water wise and making sure that they are regulated on their water consumption. Right. Um, Michael, uh, another big debate at City Hall that's going on is a proposed charter amendment for the November ballot that would align the charter with our still new district election system. If there's a vacancy on the council, as there will be when one of you gets sworn in, when Greg Hart joins the Board of Supervisors, should that vacancy be filled by appointment of the council or should the voters decide in a special election? I think both. Uh, Greg just uh, came into office, so he's gonna have you know, three quarters of his term left. Um, I've heard arguments where people have said, well, what if there is a quarter of a term left? You know, like in our situation, we're, gonna, we're all going through a campaign. Whoever wins is going to have 18 months. Or in other words, they're going to have to start campaigning again while they're actually on council and learning all those ropes. Um, and I think that needs to be calculated in this question. But for Greg, for Greg Hart's uh, open seat, I think we need to do both. I think we need to appoint. And I think the last six months, or the last five months rather, is a good example of why we need to appoint to make sure that we don't get in gridlock and we have seven council members so we can finalize votes. So just to, just to clarify, so you're saying that when Hart leaves the council, the council should appoint his successor? And then have a special election, correct, both. And, and how, long, how long, so would the person who's appointed be able to run in that special election? I think so. Okay, and how long would the appointment last? The appointment would last for, we'd have to decide six months, just like we were given, maybe? I don't think, I think from our situation, whoever they were, they were gonna appoint would fill in the six months, but then they weren't gonna be allowed to run. That was their idea they threw out. So what do you right? think? How do you think it should be addressed in the, in the charter? I think, I think it should be an election, just like we're going through right now, just so that the candidates can be properly vetted. So it's straight special election. Yeah. All right. How about you, Elizabeth? I agree. I think straight special election. I think that the people should decide, you know, who they want to represent them. That's what democracy is all about. Ken? I agree I, with the straight special election. All right. I mean, um, why, why wait for a certain period of time to have someone appointed in there? Let's go right to the special election and let's, uh, let's let democracy live. Let's let the voters vote, the people vote. I, I guess one of the arguments was it was going to cost a lot of money to have a special, special election, just to have an election about that. So they moved it to June because it would be cheaper. So the question is, should there be a three to three split on the council or, or just six members of the council until the next election comes up? Or mm -hmm. I'm still for a special election. All right. Good. Good try on changing my mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know entirely too much about this. Um, Elizabeth, in November, uh, California voters are going to decide on a ballot measure. Did I do that right? Or was who, who? 
I'm not sure I what order know. we were. Yeah, I don't know. Remember I what think I there. answered first, right? Yeah, I think okay, so. Okay, so we're back to you. Sure. All right. Um, California voters are going to decide on a ballot measure that would authorize rent control mm -hmm. throughout the state. Should Santa Barbara have rent controls to protect tenants? I believe that the power to decide that should go to the people of, of those communities. So when you talk about repealing that, that law, I, I think we should, so that way the people of that city can vote and determine that themselves. So you, we should have a vote on rent control in Santa mm -hmm. Barbara, you're saying? Yeah. You think it's a good idea? Absolutely. You've got to give control to the people that live in that city. No, I mean, do you think rent control is a good idea? Well, we got to make sure that our renters feel protected and represented because that's one of the reasons why a lot of the people can't afford to live here. But like I said, we've got to make sure that the people of the city decide that. So that's a big yes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it you depends in, on what they vote. You in favor of rent control? I, I am in favor of it as, as somewhat of a last resort, especially with just how expensive housing is and how many people feel insecure with their housing. I think that's a big issue, and we really need to address that. All right, Ken? I'm for, uh, yes, uh, rent control. I, I'd like to look at it, uh, but I do think the voters need to vote on it, And uh, but I am in favor, ultimately, I'm in favor of rent control. Michael? Rent control sounds like a good idea, the thing is, I always try to look. I try to look for examples where things work. I'm not smart enough to think of my own ideas, so I try to bring ideas. And I don't have any examples where you rent control been a works. Then, right? <laughs> um, I think there's other ways to accomplish what rent control tries to accomplish, but gets tied up in courts a lot of times. So, for example, with AUD, average unit size density, there's a way we can put inclusionary housing, whether it be 20, 30 percent. And there's a way that we can accomplish the same thing that rent control would do as far as putting a rent on, on a ceiling on the rent. Um, rent control is a work in progress that got implemented in the early 70s. And there are negative implications that come with rent control. So, for example, if you have a unit that has rent control, those folks are not moving, which is a good thing. On the flip side, it limits the supply of housing. So those units that don't have rent control the pricing can start to move up a lot more. And I think we need to be cautious and aware of those unintended consequences. It's not an easy solution, whether it's yes or no, because the needs of the community needs to be addressed. And when we talk about our you know, firefighters, our police, when we talk about even our, you know, the folks that, that wash dishes, they're all important. And a lot of them don't live in Santa Barbara. And we, it's not good for the economy. It's not good for their kids having to move around public, from school to school. And having that consistency of staying in the neighborhood is really important. But there's other ways to accomplish that. So you're, you, you're no one. I'm the only one that's no, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Elizabeth, how significant a factor do you think the problem of panhandlers and homeless people on State Street is in the decline of our main retail corridor? I don't think that the panhandling is extremely aggressive. I don't think that that's much of an issue. Definitely homelessness is a huge issue in Santa Barbara. I will not deny that. When it comes to that, the only thing I can su suggest is that having the voters vote on a bond measure to supply more shelter and housing for the homeless to at least get them off the streets and get them in a safer place. So you don't, you don't think it's a big factor in why there's a lot of vacancies on State Street? I don't think that that plays into it. I think it's more the price of rent. How big, a, how big a deal do you think it is, homelessness and panhandling in contributing? Homelessness is a, is a, is a big deal. No, I mean in contributing to the, to the decline of State Street. Oh, to the decline of State Street? Yeah. Well, it's not the aggressive panhandling so much as the, um, as, okay, on Lower State Street, if you walk it, you can pick up certain smells, and that's a big turnoff to tourists and to even our local people. Uh, you don't want to go into a nice restaurant and before you have your meal, you smell urine or is that okay to say on TV? <laughs> but um, see, that's the issue. So we have to we have to clean it up a little bit. And, and to her comment about monies, the Senate Bill Two uh, includes monies for to. Um, that's a, big, that's a yeah. big housing bill at the, the, the Sacramento. Pier. But also, there's a, a, a part in there, a portion in there that goes towards helping the homelessness. And so, uh, and again, Senate Bill Three also helps our vets. There's money. If that's that's a bond measure. So, um, 
And um, so what I'm saying here is that uh, it's not a huge issue, uh, the panhandling. Uh, we see it a lot. Um, but, uh, and I think that the city is doing a lot of work with that, with, with policing that on State Street. Um, however, the homelessness, that's a, that's a bigger issue. We, we, need to, we need to help the homelessness in our, in our city. You're a small business owner. I mean, the, uh, how do you feel about the businesses on State Street who say, you know, this is, this is killing our business down here, uh, the, the panhandling, homelessness, uh, how big a factor? For my own customers, I hear more about their per the permitting process than I do the homeless problem. The other question is, is when have we not had panhandlers on State Street? And when we don't have a problem with filling in vacancies, well, what's the problem there? Or what did we do well there? Well, all of a sudden, when we have vacancies that started during the Great Recession, and we've never been able to close that gap since then, I think they're just the easiest scapegoat. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity that we need to address. It's not the reason why we have vacancies downtown. What do you think, Oscar? Do we need to uh, have more uh, police presence on panhandlers and stuff to help rejuvenate State Street? Uh, no, I, I think the the climate's changing when it comes to retail. You know, and and our local businesses have to adapt because uh, it seems like now more days people are willing to go to a business for the experience as opposed to just the products because anybody can can order things on Amazon. That's a big issue. You know, is that Amazon's sucking up all these small businesses or even big businesses now, you know? So it's gotta be an experience for somebody to wanna to come down there. So the, the downtown businesses should, should start looking into, you know, using more things like the access card that people can buy that gives them like two for one meals or things like that. Uh, you know, being more, you know, active with their social media presence. Um, you know, being members of uh, Uber Eats where your food can be delivered to your house, things like that. Like they, they basically need to take advantage of the technology that's there right now so that their businesses can be more accessible to people who technically don't have to necessarily go down there to enjoy it. But, you know, it's, it's an overall global issue to tell you the truth with what's going on with just online shopping. It's taking away business from everywhere. But to deal with the, with the homeless situation or, or to scapegoat them, it's not necessarily fair. And, and I feel like, yeah, you know, Senate Bill, Senate Bill 2 could, could, uh, could help build more housing for the homeless. But we need to move as a city, move on that fast, because LA's got their eye on that. And if LA takes it over, then we'll lose our chance to be able to fund uh, building more housing for the homeless. All right. Um we're going to hear closing statements from each of the candidates in just a minute. I got one more question. One of the reasons this election is so crucial is because District 3 representative will be the tie-breaking vote on a council that's been gridlocked on a lot of 3-to-3 three three votes so far. Whose policies and politics do you identify with more on the current council? Mayor Kathy Murillo or Council Member Jason Dominguez? <laughs> Well, <laughs> let me just put it this way. The, the city council is, should not be partisan. It's not intended to be partisan. So, um, and when I go in there, I'm just going to tell you this. It doesn't matter where the, where the party's divided, because sometimes, even though it's nonpartisan, um, sometimes people lean towards the party line. And I want to put it, I kind of want to put it into that. I want, I want everyone, I want to make the decision on what is best for Santa Barbara. I want to make that decision what is best for the community. I don't want it, I don't want to make a decision based on, um, you know, whether Kathy Murillo's voting on this or Jason Dominguez voting that way. I want to make the decision that is the best decision to be made for the interest of the community. Jason or Kathy? I'll take answer C. Um, I'll, be, <laughs> I'll be the bridge between Kathy and Jason. And I think we've needed a bridge for a very long time. And I think that the dysfunction of city council when it comes to gridlock votes, um, it's an opportunity that everybody on the council can, can, can make a change to. Um, so I'll repeat that I will be the bridge between those two. You'll be on with Kathy, right? No. So, <laughs> so the thing is, is, talking to somebody who's been going to the city council meetings, you, you'll notice that about 80% of the time they are actually voting unanimously. Those first couple of months, yeah, they're rocky, you know, like having a, a new group of people to work with. 
yeah, you, you kind of bump heads every now and then, but they've been working together fairly well, and I respect both of them. Both of them have been, you know, role models for me. So I would vote and will always vote for the best interest of the city. Kathy or Jason? I agree with what a lot has been already said. I, <laughs> I said it first. I <laughs> said it first. I said it first. He gets all the credit. <laughs> all right. So, yes, I don't, I don't see that I would side more with one over the other. I think that I will make my decision based on what is best for District 3 and for this community of Santa Barbara. All right. Okay. So uh, I'm going to stop talking now and, and let you all uh, talk directly to the voters. And uh, um, why don't we go with the reversal when we started. Michael, uh, your closing statement, 90 seconds, two minutes. What's in this camera right here? Yep. Great. Thank you, everybody. Third District, I'm talking to you. As you walk around the streets of, of our neighborhood, whether it be daytime or nighttime, and you see these cars just rushing by because there's limited four-way stop signs, when you're pulling out of your driveway and people are parking so close to your driveway that you have all these blind spots, we're talking about public safety concerns. I've had years of experience managing budgets. I've had years of experience leading people. And I feel like I can be the individual that can help bring the city together and help increase voter engagement to ultimately become, bring more resources to the third district. So I'd be honored if on June 5th, you'd vote for Michael Vidal. Thank you. Ken Rivas. Hi, I'm Ken Rivas. And um, I feel that I'm the best candidate for this job. When we think about a district, a representative of a district, a neighborhood, a community. For years, I've been working with communities and with neighborhoods and trying to help them. And in, in a lot of cases, we've had very many successes uh, with Neighborhood Advisory Council. And I encourage people to take a opportunity to go to one of the NAC meetings and uh, learn what it's about because they're gonna carry your concerns to city council, something that I've done for many years with former uh, city mayors. So experience, if you want someone experience in working with communities, experience in working with city council and getting the job done, vote for me June 5th. Thank you. Elizabeth Hunt. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Hunter and I am born and raised on the west side. And I highly encourage any of you to contact me with any questions that you may have. And please vote on June 5th. Thank you. Oscar Gutierrez. Hi, I'm Oscar Gutierrez. I was born and raised on the west side. And, you know, I'm for you. And I want to represent you on the city council because I've spent my whole life making sure that everyone in this community stays informed with what's going on. And I'll be doing that as your representative at any point, if you ever feel like there's a concern or issue that you feel that we need to know about, I'll be there for you and I'll be accessible to you as much as you need me to. And I'll also work on making sure that the other departments and the issues that you have with them would be resolved at a you know, fast uh, time. So please vote for me on June 5th. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all again very much, uh, mm -hmm. not only for coming tonight, but again for putting yourselves out there to the community and, and taking the risks and putting up with all the abuse and <laughs> smart-ass questions and so on. So thanks to tonight's guest, uh, Oscar Gutierrez, Elizabeth Hunter, Ken Rivas, Michael Vidal, and thank you all for watching. Please visit our website, newsmakerswithjr.com, where you can check out my regular blog posts on the campaign and politics in Santa Barbara and find all of our shows and special interviews on our YouTube channel. Thanks to our director, J.P. Montalvo, to our crew, Diane, Suzanne, Ken, and Lauren, and as always, our top-ranking, high-powered, high-energy, senior executive producer, Hap Freund. We'll see you next time on Newsmakers.